Amber is probably well known to all of you. She um, has been a leader uh, in our community for many years now. Uh, she has had vision and uh, energy and drive and gets things done. And the big thing that she has done that we all know about is uh, the grain mill in Skowhegan. She had the vision to look at the jail where I used to spend quite a lot of time. <laughs> and uh, the last thing I would ever have thought of when I was in there that it would become what it is today, um, the grain mill. And she is the uh, co-founder of Maine Grains. She is the CEO of Maine Grains. She is also uh, a co-founder and board member of the Maine Grain Alliance. And in addition, she is the manager of the, uh, oh, I can't read my writing. The, <laughs> the, the Miller's Table. The Miller's Table, which is the restaurant that I've named just on my mind. So, uh, with this, I'm not going to go on much longer. This is my, the end of my introduction. I'd like you all to welcome Amber Lampke tonight. Thank you. Thank you, John. And if it's okay with you, John, and uh, everyone, I'm just going to stand down here with that. Hi up. Um, and with such a familiar group, I'm happy to take this conversation wherever folks would like it to go. If there's burning questions you have you want to know about, or if you want to um, uh, throw out particular topics that you're, that you're dying to hear more about, I'll, I'll take this conversation anywhere you like. Um, um, and thank you for having me. These kinds of talks are fun. I was telling you. Uh, John and Cheryl, that I was up at the Emden Historical Society about a month ago, and that was very fun to just realize what do people in the local community know about, um, uh, what have they heard, and what questions do they still have. So um, I'll give a, just a brief summary, and then um, I'm happy to sort of dive into particular topics. But um, as John said, I've been in the community about 20 years. Uh, I grew up in Brunswick, Maine and went away to college to uh, get a master's degree in communication disorders. And I was practicing as a speech language pathologist back in Portland, Maine when I met Mike, uh, contra dancing in North Whitefield. And uh, we had uh, a fair bit of time of commuting back and forth while dating. So I was visiting Scott Egan while he was living on the back road. And we bought our first house on Water Street in Scott Egan, that uh, yellow Victorian that used to be kind of a dusty blue. Uh, right next door to a sister Victorian, right next door to it, that has a barn in the back that is shared. And we bought that house, and then we visited John for our marriage license, only to learn that there was like a waiting period that we didn't know about. And so, uh, so we couldn't get our whatever the document was you needed to get married without John's permission to uh, skip the waiting period. So uh, anyway, I got to meet John as one of my first uh, entry points to Scout. <laughs> and John let us get married on the timeline that we planned. Um, and then Mike and I, uh, this was 2001, so we got married September 1st, 2001. So right before 9-11. And we got married in Brunswick. We went up to Cape Breton on our honeymoon and we were bicycling the Cape Breton Trail on our, on our tandem bike. Um, when 9-11 happened back in New York. And it was, it was kind of surreal because we, we weren't bumping into a lot of Americans, but we passed these Americans on bikes on the top of a mountain one day and they said, you know, there's some crazy things going on back home. Mind you, this was a little bit before cell phones. I had my first cell phone, but it was a, it was a cheap flip phone, flip phone and it was hard to get cell service. And they said, you know, wherever you're landing tonight, try to turn on a TV and just get caught up. And so, so we landed at the Airbnb. We decided to call home to Brunswick just to let people know where we were and how to get a hold of us if we needed to know anything. I was thinking about my college roommates who lived in New York at the time. Um, and, and of course, lo and behold, Mike lost the best man that had just been in our wedding in one of the airplanes. And so it was a weird time to, uh, we, we cut our honeymoon short. We took the Scotia Prince back to Portland. We drove right to Massachusetts to be with um, his wife. And here we're newly married and we're grieving with this woman who's just lost her husband who's become a good friend. And then moving back to Skowhegan, deciding to paint this Victorian house yellow and, 
and we're sitting across the street from the house one day, sort of just assessing our color choice, and is this the right choice, and yeah, you know, the whole house hadn't been painted yet, and this car drives by and yells out the window, um, your colors suck! <laughs> <laughs> and we're <laughs> like, right on, right? <laughs> Um, so it, it was a, it was a, it was an experience for me to be moving to an area where uh, I didn't know anything about Central Maine, um, and I, as a speech pathologist, I was traveling the state a lot at that point. Um, in, I was in and out of different schools and group homes, working with a wide variety of families and therapists and um, clients with different needs, and often in that role, I felt like I was always stepping into conflicted situations, <laughs> because there, we would have um, kind of in an intense set of needs that everyone was working on, and maybe different points of view about how to improve a situation. So in my early 20s, I feel like I was getting lots of experience with conflict resolution, and um, um, hearing all sides of an argument, and trying to make forward progress in any way we could. And, um, all the, I, I'm starting here with this group because you're familiar with this process we've been through to acquire the jail and start some businesses. And, um, and I just was walking into a lot of this work with the frame of mind that um, com conflict is sometimes uh, part of the process and that every little step we can take towards toward the end goal is actually a step in the right direction toward the end goal. And so, so in the early stages, I just felt like I'm not doing anything different than I'm already doing. I'm just solving a different kind of problem. Um, so anyway, grains happened sort of accidentally uh, for me. I um, was in Skowhegan practicing as a speech pathologist. We were starting to have kids. Um, the first Main Street director in 2005 uh, came to me, Audrey, and said, could I, could I help her start a farmer's market in Skowhegan? Uh, because it sh farmers markets are proving to uh, welcome people into downtowns in a way that's good for other businesses around them. And I, was, I had to say to Audrey, we already have a farmers market. It's, it's the three people that meet behind the chamber every Saturday. And they've been at this a long time. And I don't think we want to start a new market. I think we want to understand how to help them uh, with their goals and figure out um, uh, why and why it's not growing and if it can grow and how do we do that. And, um, so I, I reached out to Billy Barker at the time, who was the market manager, and I said, um, how can I help? What do you need? Um, what, what are the obstacles? And, and can we work together on figuring out how to grow the market larger? And, and I met in that process Charlotte Hillis, Mike Vermette's wife, who was not a real active member of the market. Mike was the face. Do you all know Mike Vermette, the Highland cattle? Yep. Uh, so Mike was the real face of the market. But Charlotte was behind the scenes um, sending flowers and sending bouquets of flowers and helping with anything she could do in the market. So she came forward at that time, showed up at, the, at our yellow house with a bouquet of flowers and said, hi, I'm Charlotte and I'm here to help and you know, let's, let's work on all this together. So that period of time from 2005, six, seven, eight, when we were focused on how to grow the market larger was really I tell people it took no money at all. It just took um, getting to know each other <laughs> and knocking on doors and welcoming people in and figuring out how we could partner with groups to grow the farmer's market, which was very successful. Um, you remember that it took a step from the Chamber of Commerce over to the Grange parking lot when it grew to 12 vendors. And then at one point it was 21 vendors and it still needed to go to a larger place. And um, so those years, I think I was uh, just branding myself inadvertently as someone who could get things done. And, and I, at that point, I still had never written a grant. I wasn't running a business. I was just helping out the community. Um, the Barden family from Maine would heat. They had become good friends of ours. And Albie was starting to build these beautiful wood-fired ovens for bread bakers in Maine that were asking um, where they could get more locally grown wheat and why we weren't growing more wheat in Maine um, as part of this kind of surging local foods movement. And if you remember some of these challenges that were coming out at the community level, you know, can you eat within 100 miles for a week or, or whatnot, you have your wild cards like black pepper and olive oil and wheat was often a wild card in these challenges. So 
we were asking ourselves, well, why is that? And we've grown a ton of grain um, in this region in our history, so how come it's not happening anymore? And Albie had tried to get a, um, a gathering, or he did get a gathering together in Albion uh, in 2006, a very first conversation with Michael Scholes, my business partner and friend, um, and a couple of farmers to figure out um, how do we cooperate more around grains. And then he came to me for help and he said, look, I need help with the organizing. I think we need to be having more conversations that, um, shot, that, that will shine a light on grains as an important topic for the area. So the needing conference was born out of that desire uh, among a grassroots group of us to start conversations between farmers and millers and bakers and oven builders about, you know, that first year the question was if we could grow grains, but what quickly became apparent after the 2007 first needing conference, we had about 75 people there and one of the uh, um, agricultural historians uh, from Maine, Mark Fulford, came and said, you know, Somerset County grew 239,000 bushels of wheat in the mid-1800s. That was enough to feed over 100,000 people just in Somerset County, back when planting and harvesting was being done by hand and horses. And so um, that changed the conversation pretty rapidly to not if, if can we grow grains, but how do we restore that knowledge and what's missing to do that again. Uh, Michael Scholes, uh, it, my friend, I met working at Pine Tree Camp in our college years. And um, he later married uh, the nurse from the infirmary at camp that he had been smitten with all those years, Julie Phelps, who's now a family physician in Waterville. Um, and we both realized we had moved back to this area at about the same time uh, with our families. And he was baking bread out of one of Abby's ovens in Albion at his house and driving to New Brunswick, Canada to buy his flour, uh, a heritage variety that was being freshly milled by a really small mill in an old cob barn um, uh, at a mill called Spearville Mill. So after that first meeting conference, I asked Michael if I could jump in the car with him and go see what a mill looks like because we had all these empty buildings in Skowhegan and there was this Main Street effort trying to imagine uh, what could occupy all of our empty buildings and who would restore them. And a lot of these Main Street uh, conferences that I was going to as a board member then at the time, I spent six years on the board of Main Street, um, it just felt like the, the, the attention at these conferences was how to lure the wealthy developer from out of state to your town to sell them on your white elephant building and maybe they will have a good idea for it. Um, and so I, I just, I, I, at that time I was starting to feel like, well, what does that have to do with these surveys we're putting out in Skowhegan uh, for what the people want here? <laughs> you know, we, if we want a bookstore and we want a coffee shop and we want places to stroll and we want more in-town gardens and all of that, you know, it does, is someone else going to solve that for us or should we be focused on how we can solve that for ourselves? And, so I, so I took that trip with Michael to go see what a mill looked like, and I was kind of stunned at how small it was. Um, you know, the barn itself was no bigger than this space, and it was two stories, and they were sending grain to the top story and, and gravity feeding down to very small mill machines. Um, and here he was driving all the way up there to pick up flour for his baking operation and bring it back to Albion. And then I was driving all the way to Albion uh, to pick up a carload of bread every week to bring back and sell to all of our friends here in Skowhegan. So, um, so in any event, milling, in my mind, started to feel more tangible, and what we were learning at the meeting conference was that farmers were lacking um, the machinery that would take weed seeds out of wheat. So vetch, which is a very common um, undergrowth, uh, green manure and weed, if it gets picked up with your harvesting, is very hard to separate because it's about the same size as wheat, but it's it's a different shape. And vetch won't hurt you if you eat it, but if you mill it up into the flour, it looks like you have bugs in your flour and then it, it, it's, it's unsightly. And so that was a problem. We didn't have a way to sort that out. Um, we had no machines in the state of Maine at this time um, to crack the husky coating off of oats. So a lot of the potato growers in Arista County um, and folks around here were planting oats and rye as cover crops, but not being able to harvest them and make use of them because of lack of machinery and market uh, for those grains. 
So we realized the infrastructure challenges early on in 2007 and almost immediately started working on how do we learn more about what this would take and uh, could we do this here? Initially not at all thinking it would be us to start a mill. We thought we would recruit a mill to come to Skowhegan. Um, and so we visited Spearville, but then we set out to, together to go see any milling operation in the Northeast that we could see. And there were, uh, Rhode Island still has some active mills. Um, some are water mills. Many of them are kind of antique quality demonstration mills to show you how we used to do things. And then there was a little bit of grain you could buy in a gift shop. You know, so it wasn't really feeding a community. We went out to Butterworks Farm in Vermont to meet with Jack Laser, who's one of the pioneers in, in our generation uh, for organic grain production. He was milling out of a barn with uh, equipment that he had patched together and um, uh, really was saying, these local boards are driving me crazy. I can't, I can't have them out on my farm. I can't make enough flour for everybody that wants it. Um, I'm making a little bit, but somebody else needs to do this at better scale because if, if I'm gone tomorrow, nobody knows how to run all of this. Um, so we heard that story over and over in the Northeast in any operation that we saw, and it felt very fragile. And like we were not necessarily restoring a body of knowledge around milling that was gonna live on beyond these individuals. So, um, still not certain if this would be Michael and I to start a mill. I decided to enroll in a week-long course at Kansas State University's International Grains Program. Uh, there's only two places to formally learn flour milling in the world. Um, Kansas State is one, or you can go to Switzerland, where they still make a lot of this Bueller equipment for milling cocoa powder and flour for some of the largest mills um, that exist. So. Um, I'd have liked to go to Switzerland, but I went to Kansas because that was uh, uh, an easier sell. And, and it was a week-long course that covered everything from grading grain to all the varieties of, of wheat that there are, um, uh, what diseases to look for, what makes a food-grade grain versus something that we shouldn't eat. Uh, we spent a day in a demonstration bakery where at K-State they're kind of training up the next generation of, um, as they put it, Sarah Lee bakers. You know, the bakers that are going to go into production facilities and learn how to make the sandwich loaf that is going to be the same volume every single time. And it's going to fit in the sandwich bag at the same size. And, and um, we learned how to do what they call pup loaf tests. Um, kind of volume tests on loaves of bread to make sure that you are achieving consistency um, with your methods. We got to see different varieties of wheat milled into flour all used in the same recipe. So let's say you made a sugar cookie and a, and a white pan loaf and a cake um, and you use the same recipe but you use pastry flour, bleached flour, um, white bread flour, um, whole grain flour and you get to see the impact of those different flours on the recipe based on brand, protein, different uh, measures in the wheat. So we spent a day doing that. Uh, they had a demonstration flour mill at K-State that was a five-story concrete cinder block building full of um, this, a lot of, a lot of it was the Swiss machinery, Bueller machines uh, to make white flour. And they were using gravity to feed machines by sending grain to the very top. And <coughs> The machines were designed to sort and clean and with air and screens um, mill the flour on roller mills. So these were not stone mills, but white flour is made on roller mills that take the grain and feed it in between steel rolls and essentially shear. They work to shear away all the endosperm in the kernel um, and you go through multiple breaks. So they go through the rolls lots of times to try to shear all of that white endosperm away from the bran. The kernels are soaked in advance so that the bran coat starts to swell and, and, and pop away from the endosperm. And then, you know, the very final stage after you go through all the breaks is a machine that uses air and screens to separate about seven different streams. And when you're looking at the output, you can see bran and germ and cream of wheat and Bob's Red Mill brown cream of wheat and white flour and so you can see all the grades that are being separated out. You know, on the very end is your white, white, white flour and in a mill like that, that was the end goal. That's all that was being saved. 
Um, that drops down another floor, and the very final stage is to dump these powdered nutrients back into the white flour, churn it up, and then bag it up as flour, because you've just removed all, everything that was healthy about the kernel has just been taken out. Um, and, you know, we realized that a mill like that, that a demonstration mill like that making white flour is capable of about 600 tons a day if it's working at full capacity. Um, that it, we, will, we will do 2,500 tons this year. So a mill like that can do 600 tons in a day. It's all run by a computer lab. Um, everything is automated, and um, we were taught that you know, operators can now leave the mill with a pager, and if something plugs up, the technology exists to just call people back and, and come solve a problem. So they almost run with you know, very, very little labor. Um, so that course was instrumental for me. Remember, I was still at this point of wanting to learn more and figure out what do I need to know to try to recruit this kind of um, infrastructure to Skowhegan. But at this course, there were only 12 people in the course, um, international programs and people from all over the world. Uh, um, no other females as the only female there. There was a guy from India there to learn more about rice dehulling. There were um, guys from Colorado who were plant managers for large white flour mills. There was a guy from Switzerland there to learn more about grain grading so that he could trade grain futures more effectively on the market. So it was all over the map why people wanted milling knowledge. And I was raising my hand to say, um, these parts of what I'm learning here are really useful. This part of what I'm learning isn't exactly what we plan to do. We want to run a stone mill in Maine. Well, Maine didn't even show up on the map as a grain producing state because we produced less than a thousand acres of food grade grains at that time. And um, I said we're really focused in Maine on organic grain production because if we grow organic grains for food, that helps organic dairy farmers that are at a loss right now for affordable feed and affordable straw for their barns, which is all part of maintaining organic certification. So the University of Maine was already focused on trying to help dairy farmers grow organic grains here in Maine. And in Kansas, they're telling us that organic grain production in this country is less than one-tenth of one percent of what we're doing. And so kind of not really on their radar and not a lot of resources or concern about it um, in the heartland of where most of our grain is grown. Um, so that was all eye-opening. And then finally, I said, well, um, we want a stone mill. Our, our plan is to make flour on stones. Michael was sold on the beautiful quality of this flour that he was getting up in New Brunswick and that it was light and fluffy and freshly milled and full of flavor. And he always describes nice flour as voluptuous. It should feel really soft and lively in your hand. And so we were looking at stone mills, um, which were no longer made in this country. We were looking abroad at purchasing machinery. And in Kansas, they said, uh, I asked the oldest guy on faculty there, could he point me in the direction of a book on stone milling? Um, because white flour milling isn't what we intended to do. And he said, he didn't think there was a single book in the library there on stone milling. And, and so that was a turning point for me that we are not going to formally learn this anywhere. Right? So if we're, if we're going to learn to stone mill, we're going to go find this knowledge peer to peer. We're going to need to go talk with people that have it. Um, Peter Mills became a good pal of mine at this time because uh, we were entertaining, you know, could we partner with Spearville and, and get their help in mill start up here? So I, went to him for some legal advice and you know he, he was steering us in the direction of just doing it you know the, the the knowledge that someone will share there's so much to know and there's so much to know about Skowhegan and the local uh, resources that will come to bear to help you put this project together your your interest in what they know is probably a five-year interest and this will be difficult to orchestrate you know maybe maybe you should just start this so he wrote us our operating agreement and we launched a business um, and, and, and then Peter became a good uh, helper to me as we then looked at the county jail building as a potential site for this. It was really the Kansas course that, that allowed me to come back and see that building um, with a fresh set of eyes. And really, we were just looking at the height. So um, the four-story section where we have three floors 
um, that, were, that were cell blocks uh, and a cafeteria and then a fourth floor attic gave us the vertical height we needed that's very expensive to build for the grain operation. So, um, so we hired the associate director from Kansas to come to Skowhegan and look at that building with us and try to wrap his head around how we'd start a small regional mill out of that building. And this is a guy who is accustomed to being hired by Cargill to go set up plants in other countries. So it was this kind of a mind-bending exercise, but it, and, and he was a very conventional guy. He, um, he had nothing against uh, conventional farming, Roundup, Monsanto. I mean, that was all part of what he understood, but he also understood what we were trying to do from the perspective that He's a third generation wheat farmer from Kansas that's watched his family's 3,000 acres support fewer and fewer members of his family over the years. So he understood our desire to support small farming in Maine by bringing grain production back. So he became a good friend to our project. We hired him to come out a few times a year for the first couple of years and advise us on the machinery we needed, how to set it up and design it in order to flow all together. Um, and uh, we purchased a, a um, a set of both used and new equipment from all over the world in various places in order to get things up and running. So the timeline of things, um, 2007, first meeting conference, 2000 and 2007 to nine, attempt to buy the building, <laughs> that took a long time, uh, with the county commissioners. 2009, we were able to buy the building, inmates vacated at that point, and 2009 to 2012, we raised money, renovated, got equipment installed, and then launched the mill in 2012. So we're seven years in business um, at this point, serving grain uh, throughout the Northeast. We are uh, networked with over about 45 different organic farms at this point, not all of them from Maine. I still can't quite find all the grain we need from Maine, uh, but the numbers of acres in organic production and the numbers of tons we process every year just continue to rise as our business grows and as the market grows. We've been very lucky to have the um, kind of interest and uh, enthusiasm around local grains growing in parallel to our growth in the mill. And we've really needed that time to sort out infrastructure challenges and flow issues. And you know, if any of you been in manufacturing, you realize that as you grow over here, you reach a pinch point over here, and then you solve that pinch point, and then you have another pinch point. And so it's been a, it's been a process of kind of um, building efficiency over the years. And about three years ago, we were able to hire a 28-year veteran of Verso Paper, a machinist and pipe fitter and welder um, who has been a terrific asset to our team as a plant manager that oversees our milling staff now. And our team is now about 14 people, um, and that's everything from sales and um, bookkeeping to front office and milling staff. Um, the, the Main Grain Alliance is the nonprofit organization that was formed by this original grassroots group that started the meeting conference. And in parallel to our mill project, the Main Grain Alliance has grown to uh, do a year-round slate of activities, not only our flagship event, which is the Needing Conference in Bread Fair, but year-round educational events. We give technical assistance grants to grain-based businesses in Maine to help them scale what they're doing. Um, those are monies made possible by Allagash Brewing Company that has taken a, a pledge to source more locally grown grain and given a portion of their proceeds from a, a particular beer called 16 Counties to our efforts. Um, we've also been supported by Skowhegan Savings Bank and others to be able to give those TA grants out. The Main Grain Alliance is um, also involved in a heritage seed restoration project led by Richard Roberts, whereby we realized that one of the obstacles to growing more rare and heritage varieties of grain is actually seed supply. We've got some incredible seed breeders, plant breeders in Maine, like Will Bonzel and Industry, Ellie Ragosa, uh, Mark Fulford and others who have kept these rare, unique things alive, but the quantities of seed that existed were quite small. And so if we want to eat those grains in a loaf of bread, it really took a commitment to play what is called the seed nursery function, where you plant 10 seeds and that year you'll have 100, and then you plant 100, and then you'll have 1,000. And then, 
um, you know, exponentially increasing the supply. So Richard heads up that project at this point, and we've been successful bringing um, a few varieties back into commercial production. So uh, a variety called Servinta from Estonia that Will Bonsell was uh, taking care of and industry is now available and we can bake bread with it and is grown by some of our small farmers in central Maine. Uh, there are some other varieties coming into the pipeline, a Byron flint corn that was native to this area uh, that is now available in, you know, when I say large-ish quantities, it's one to five tons, but, but that's a lot when we started with this much. Um, there's a Danish rye variety and many others that are, that are in the works. So he's got little plots all around central Maine. You've probably seen some of them. There's, there's one in front of Maine Wood Heat. Um, there's one out in Taylor Field that's um, part of the Somerset Woods Trustees lands. Um, so that's another project of the, of the Maine Grain Alliance right now as well. Um, so I am still on the board of the Maine Grain Alliance. The mill is a for-profit venture that is trying to become a sustainable venture in the community. Um, many of you have visited us at the Miller's Table that operates as a separate business, um, but the whole goal is to showcase the grains on the menu to the local community and to visitors. Uh, we've had such good press on the project that we started having people show up at the doorstep routinely saying, can we buy your grains and can we have a tour? And when we were just a production plant, it was like, no, not again. <laughs> like, no, we can't keep stopping what we're doing. But um, at some point, we had to say, no, this is what it's all about, right? So uh, we formed the little dry goods shop. We figured out how to staff it. And then um, we were able to scale up the cafe operation to be open more often. So the whole goal of the cafe is to really take um, local talent, local assets, uh, inspired people, and put them to work uh, in this cafe venture that is showcasing the grains in the pizza dough, in the scones, in the sandwiches, um, in the barley pilaf, and the farro, and all of that that's featured um, on plates at the cafe. And that business is growing quite a, quite a bit. We've had a very big summer. We're trying to keep up with growth there by hiring a number of new roles that we've not yet ever had a, a first-time cafe manager a first-time part-time baker, um, some new servers and pizza folks that help us staff up. So um, that's been very fun. As, you know, another fun part of this growth is teaching, teaching the kids of the community how to make pizza and how to have their first jobs. And um, uh, I just learned from my sister that the talk about the high school is that um, the Miller's Table is the cool place to work. Uh, if you're a teenager, <laughs> everybody wants, wants a job there, uh, and then if you can't get a job at the Miller's Table, they go to the movie theater. <laughs> so um, I think that's a sign of success. I'm kind of proud of that. So that's what's going on. We are, um, the, the mill is a, organized as a C-Corp at this point, so I have a board of directors um, that helps me make decisions about our growth and what we, what we want to do. Um, uh, and I'm still the majority owner of the company. Michael has taken a step back to go back to baking. And <clears throat> it was about a 30 to 40 minute drive for him from Albion, which he never intended to do every day. Um, and his love is baking. So, so he is not involved in the business day to day at this point. I have a board of directors that helps me, which includes um, even the former CEO of King Arthur Flock, who was with them for 12 years. and. Uh, helped King Arthur become an employee-owned company and a certified B corporation. And when he left the company, he felt like he wanted to help other companies that had um, uh, social goals as well as business goals and, um, and was an early ally of ours in the needing companies. So he got King Arthur involved in sponsoring our early efforts here. So King Arthur's a friend and an ally in our work. And um, so we're thrilled that he said yes to being on our board. And, and then I have other representatives from investors to um, um, other folks in the community. And right now, I'm, I'm, um, we're, we've, we're, we've, we've been, we're hovering on this sustainable point where if we want to grow, I don't really want to grow in volume. Um, we, we're sort of, we've not maxed out our volume in the mill. We're still only one eight hour shift a day. And um, we've got a little more floor space that we could put more machines if we wanted to, but we've done a good job creating lots of different operations that can run at the same time in order to be efficient. 
Um, I would like to see our growth come from diversifying in the community and continuing to look at what are the other things the community desires and how do we help solve those things. Um, I'm a student right now of the Zingerman's model in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Do you guys know the Zingerman's Deli out there? Zingerman's Deli took over an old building, fixed it up, ran a very successful Jewish deli in, in a neighborhood of Ann Arbor. Um, when the deli became really successful, um, and they wanted the best quality bread for their deli sandwiches. They were driving an hour and a half away to go buy the best bread and bring it back for sandwiches every day. And then when their volume got to the point where they said, you know, at, at some point we need to stop making this drive and we need to make the bread here. And you get an inspired employee that wants to be the bread baker and start the, the baking operation. Well, then you start the baking operation. And then within that family of businesses grew a gelato operation because now we can send people up the block to go get gelato after their sandwich. Or, or, um, and now we're gonna make cheese over here because that feeds the original idea. And, we, and so they have continued to find inspired employees that wanna start their own ventures and help launch them through the infrastructure and knowledge they've built on business and management and coaching and, and all of that. So what they have now is like a, a family of 13 businesses and they even have a business that now manages the HR and the marketing and the bookkeeping, um, the creative services. And that's kind of already happening uh, for us. So we, we have main grains in the mill. We have the miller's table in the mill. We have Amy Robottom now, the cheesemaker in our mill, who's getting ready to start making cheese in her new machines next week. We've got this niche shop, we've got the radio station, um, and we've got other ideas about things we could be doing down the, future, down the road. So, uh, so I think it's, it's already starting to evolve this way where we are, as we speak, in the position of advertising for a full-time bookkeeper because Main Grains has only ever needed 20 hours of a book bookkeeper's time, but Miller's Table needs five, and Amy needs five, and the Main Grain Alliance needs 10, and so we're gonna package that, and we're gonna make a full job for somebody who manages all the pieces of that, and so that's kind of like the beginning of a creative services that somewhere down the road could encompass more than that. Um, so anyway, th th those are the ideas we're noodling around with in terms of more we could do in the community. Uh, I think that just, you know, the natural problems we set out to solve actually create new opportunities. So, you know, the growth of the cafe means when snow flies, we have limited seating, and how do we um, serve enough meals to stay open through the winter? Well, how would we solve more seating for this place? And, you know, what if we covered the courtyard? What if we covered the patio? We're kind of playing around with those ideas right now. Um, you know, so, so we now have a vacant lot next to us uh, where the KVI came down and the town is trying to sell that lot. Uh, we did put a bid in on that lot because it would be very handy to have extra space right next door that is reachable by our existing forklift. So even the Grange, which Steve Dion and I own together, is difficult to reach because you can't drive across the intersection with a forklift. And so we are using the Grange um, for some purposes that are useful to the mill, but it would be really handy to have the lot next door. Um, that, that will be a process. The, the town wants a lot of money for that lot and it's, it's valued at much, much less. So they, they, they didn't take our offer, but we'll see what happens. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what's going on. I'll pause since I'm talking a lot. And, and if there's any pieces of sort of what's gone on in Skowhegan that particularly interests people um, around grains, particular grains, health issues with grains, fundraising for all of this. Sometimes people have burning questions about how and why. Yes? No, I have a question. How do you identify and encourage uh, people to grow wheat for you? And how big an operation um, we buy grain from farms uh, ranging in size from a ton of grain at a purchase to 20 tons of grain at a purchase. Um, 20 tons fits in a, in a full tractor trailer load, uh, we, but we've got a farmer in Parkman that grows small quantities of things. And so it, I like to talk those farmers through um, it starts with price. I mean, we are meeting farmers on price with what they tell us they need to make to 
to make it worth their while. We, we, do, we, we do not price any of our grains on the commodity boards of trade that change every day. Um, we start with what the farmer is telling us they need to make. So for a farmer like Sean O'Donnell and Parkman, he's managing about 30 acres. He has, he has set up a business model whereby he's not gonna grow or sell any grain for less than 50 cents a pound. Um, and so his top market would be seed. He would sell the Fedco and Johnny's first or the malting companies in, that are now in Maine that need high germ, high germ quality um, grain. And then after that, he would sell to me and then whatever he can't sell to me, um, would be sold or fed to animals that feed his family. So he's got a model that is small, uh, but if he wants 50 cents a pound, that's going to limit what he can grow and get 50 cents a pound for. So we talk with him mostly about heritage varieties and very unique special things, and he's been a key player in this um, heritage seed restoration project. Other farmers, like up in Arista County, um, some of the potato growers need rotation crops. So this is an easy conversation to have with them if they're already having to take a break out of potatoes um, to go into something else, and we give them a market for the cover crop. So um, I discourage farmers from thinking that grains are a, are a fast cash crop. It's more that you want to think of grains as part of an economic picture that may be a three to seven to 12 year rotation. So in organic grains, you don't want to grow grain crop after grain crop after grain crop. You're going to deplete the soil of nitrogen. And so you want a good uh, rotational system that restores nutrients to the soil in cycles. So you, you alternate with legumes or clover or hay or other crops that are going to fix nitrogen. Grains are a heavy nitrogen feeder, um, and grains work well in, as a cover crop that will smother out perennial weeds. So that's why we grow things like rye and oats, um, is to manage weeds organically. So, so it's, it's more, it's a, it's a farm systems conversation. I, I think dairy farmers are, are a good group to be talking with, and so are potato farmers, but some of these inspired small farmers that are doing very diversified things on their farm are also great partners of ours. Um, it's not easy, we get a lot of calls and I funnel them all to Richard, um, but it's not easy to, to figure out, there's a lot of people with fallow land who call and say, well I've got a field and I've been paying to hay it and why don't you grow grains on it? The, the issue ends up being, um, where, is the near, excuse me, where is the nearest set of uh, equipment that can go service that field and if it's too far away, that's still a hard thing to solve. <clears throat> the Maine Grain Alliance has been able to grant funds some very small scale um, um, seed plot scale equipment for planting a seed drill, a harvester that does about an acre. It's a, it's a ride around harvester, <laughs> looks like a lawnmower, um, and some screen cleaning equipment that could do very small scale seed plots. And that can all be hauled around on a trailer, but it's not enough to harvest five acres or ten acres. But all the breweries that are springing up statewide, I remember hearing talk of going into a malting operation. What became of that? Is it still in the works or is it dead? That malting operation did start, they just chose a different community to get started in. So um, that operation was Blue Ox Malt House and they landed in Lisbon Falls in an industrial park. Um, and there is also a second malt house in Maine, in Mapleton called Buck Farms, um, uh, Maine Malt House. So malting has been a, a, one piece of the development that's been made possible by this grain economy and main coming back. So in malting, what you're doing is you're taking seed quality grain, you're moistening it and sprouting it, and that takes the enzymes in the seed coat and starts to mobilize the sugars and pre-digest them. It deposits sugars on the exterior of the grain if you halt the malting process and then kiln dry it. You've essentially caramelized some of those carbohydrates in the kernel onto the kernel so that when a beer maker takes it and grinds it up for their mash, those sugars are readily available for uh, making alcohol. So the two small scale malt, malt houses in Maine are, are supplying the over 130 breweries in Maine now with at least a portion of their ingredients. You'll, you're seeing lots and lots of breweries start to um, uh, pledge the use of more locally grown grain. It's a lot more expensive and so it's a hard sell. Um, much of the malt that brewers use comes out of Canada and um, is very, very cheap because of large, large scale um, agriculture. So uh, 
The grain that we sell to brewers, we sell to about 45 different breweries now, is raw. We don't malt, but that can be about 10% of a brewer's recipe where oats, for example, are used in stouts and they make your beer creamy and um, um, they give it a, a mouthfeel and a foam characteristics that, that brewers are looking for. So even that is a great market for us. Even that little 10% sliver that um, where we might play is a great market for us. So are you sort of excluded from considering making a third operation? Do the, do the, do the uh, tools meet the need now? I, I, feel like, I feel like those malt houses are worth supporting. I, I'm not working on malting, no. I think that there's huge voids still in um, uh, risk taking and acceptance of local grains and everyday products. And um, there are other milling operations like ours in pockets all over the country and world right now. So there's a miller down in North Carolina that we stay connected with who runs a, she started a mill as a co-op of bakers that wanted to freshly mill their own thing. There's a mill in Phoenix, Arizona, a guy from the t tech world who started this mill with his daughter really to service restaurants and make pasta out of desert varieties of wheat. So they're doing a very different thing, but we all stay connected with each other to swap stories. And he's the one who told me he does a lot of value-added <coughs> products already. Um, so pizza flour and, um, and he makes pasta and crackers and things like that. And he said, you know, even if you don't want to be a primary um, cracker on the market, you have to push the competition um, and interest the, the, the customer base in what you're doing to drive change sometimes. And I feel like every culture has its flatbread, and in the US that's pizza, and it's like pulling teeth to get pizza makers to spend a penny or two more on their cost of goods in a dough ball. Um, really, I mean, we're doing it easily at the Miller's table. Like pizza, you should be able to cover your costs and do fine. And just it, when it comes down to large scale production, just you, we're not finding those pizza makers in Maine and they're all over Maine that are, are willing to spend a dime more on their, on their ingredients. And so that's just a shame and I feel like that's a gaping hole in the market right now. But <laughs> needs to be addressed. <laughs> um, the banker, so the bankery buys our flour, they turn it into pizza dough, and we turn around and buy it back. And the Bigelow does the same thing, but Bigelow has a, a custom recipe that puts some of the spent grains from the brewery in their dough, so it's different, but, um, but same thing. And so that's a nice business for the bankery, and it's just a microcosm picture of what we could be doing uh, more broadly. That's just one example, but... Um, so why is that? Why is it because they know that their market for pizza is so undiscriminating that there's no point in making a better local pizza dough because the people who eat pizza don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't have money. <laughs> grains cracked open to be able to access the carbohydrates on the inside in the sort of digestive process of the, um, the steep, what's happening in the steeping process. Some, a lot of the small brewers don't have equipment to do that themselves, so we will flake it, crack it, grind it, uh, whatever they ask us to do. And we've got the means to do all of those things in the mill now. Allagash Brewery buys a lot of grain from us, but they've got all their own grinding equipment, so, so their product goes out as whole berries, and then they grind it when they're ready. What's the rate yield of uh, per acre for your normal grains? It's about a ton to the acre in an, in an average yield. Yeah, so we'll do about 2,500, 2,500 tons of grain this year. So that's about 2,500 acres of grain. And a, a new market that we've um, just um, been successful with in the last year and I hope to grow is, you know, I think of our our marketplace is bakers, brewers, and chefs in the Northeast. So we're really not marketing outside of Maine to New York City. And, um, but the chef segment 
um, is exploding right now because of an interest in more plant-based eating, whole grains, and these fast casual restaurants in urban places that are giving <coughs> McDonald's and Subway a run for their money. So these grain bowls with a veg, a grain, a protein, and you're out the door for 10 bucks. And, and um, so we're, we're selling to one restaurant chain that has fast become our largest customer, which is a little scary and good. And so we want a couple more of those. Um, but they're just buying a pearled farro. So they're not making bread, they're not making beer, they're just cooking it <laughs> and feeding it to people with sauteed vegetables and little chicken or tofu and, <laughs> you know, and, and it's a rapidly growing restaurant um, chain and there are tons like them. Yes? Could you speak about the role of the university and the agricultural? Yeah. Yeah, the University of Maine has a program up at the Rogers Farm now for studying grains, and we've been very lucky that that program has been funded with some sizable grants in parallel to our development of infrastructure and milling, so that I, if, if a farmer needs um, technical help growing grains, I'm sending them to the University of Maine. Um, so it is a cooperative extension program led by Dr. Ellen Mallory and some colleagues up there. They got funding to study organic bread wheat production in Maine for several years, and that project allowed me and several farmers and millers from Maine and Vermont to take our first trip to Denmark to meet millers and um, growers over there. And it was my first uh, encounter with small-scale millers that were doing exactly what we wanted to do. Um, and then, so that led me to go back again and meet with the couple that were really at the scale that I thought we wanted to be at and learn even more. They've continued their work at the Rogers Farm. They do um, field tours up there and they've been able to find other funding to focus on different grains. So right now they're focused on oats. Um, they've also, with the rise in interest of breweries in Maine and using local grains, they've gotten some money to study malting barley varieties and what we'll do well in Maine. So um, that's been a terrific resource, terrific resource for us. And Ellen Mallory sits on our board of the Main Grain Alliance in order to bring that perspective. Today, I think along with this as a liaison with farmers for marketing purposes for you all, expanding the uh, growing growing Um, a little bit. They. They've never been funded to do a major market study, which they'd be interested in doing, but it's that kind of, it's the push-pull of do you, do you start making a product and, and start finding your market, or do you study the market first and then decide if you're going to make something? Um, it's 2019. So in 2008, when we so 10, 11 years ago, a lot of our economic development agencies and funding organizations in Maine were not ready to talk about grains and take them seriously. So we would go to CEI and MTI and Department of Economic and Community Development and just get closed doors left and right because grains are too niche. If you're talking about creating a food hub, well, maybe we'd be interested in talking with you. So are you going to develop a distribution business? Are you going to... Are you going to help build storages for farms? It's like they, it's like there's a there's a there's a focused attention on a particular issue at any point in time, and they were not ready for grains ten or twelve years ago. So so it really pushed us to find other innovative solutions for fundraising and and all of that. And we just started. Now that we've had success, now everybody wants to talk about grains, and so now MTI is funding grains. Now. Focus Maine, this new think tank in, in Portland, which is business leaders trying to create new jobs in Maine. They're all about grains and the value chain of grains. Um, CEI is funding grains. Everywhere, everywhere. Now everybody's interested. So there's some more uh, focus on marketing, but I would say mo most of the marketing and sales we do is all driven by our own two feet. Are your grain um, acreage being Infringed on by the hemp production? Um, we haven't lost any acreage to hemp. We've seen um, interested farmers who never quite pulled the trigger on grains decide to go hemp instead. We've seen that happen. 
Um, Maine, Maine is a big state and we have oh, yeah. a lot of land and even the farmers growing grain for us have a lot of access to even more land. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm still hopeful we can keep expanding what we're doing even if hemp takes off. There's, there's a lot of, I mean, I, um, we now run out of rye and I end up having to buy rye from elsewhere once I buy up everything I can find in Maine. Um, these new fast casual restaurants that need organic spelt. There were three farmers growing spelt for us and we gobbled that up really quickly. So now there's an opportunity to encourage farmers to grow more spelt if I want all of that to come from Maine. All of our spring wheat comes from Maine. All of our organic oats come from Maine. Um, all of our buckwheat comes from Maine. All of our heritage grains come from Maine. Um, I still, I don't know any Maine farmer growing pastry wheat yet. And that, you know, that's a 10 or 12 ton opportunity for somebody. And that's just a softer variety with low protein that makes great pie crust. And, and the folks in New York all love to grow it. So I end up buying that from upstate New York. Heritage Flint corn is another one that, um, it's happening, but it's, it ha um, uh, the farms around here that have grown corn are growing dent corn for cows, largely. And while you can eat that, it just doesn't taste that great. And so we're only buying these flint corn varieties that have a little more flavor and um, application as cornmeal and polenta. And so those are just, it's harder to find enough of those quantities in Maine just yet. So I'll buy a little bit from Seedsman in Rhode Island and Vermont. And I just had a thought, which is that, I mean, we're, we all love Maine, and is, is that an important part of your, I mean, let's say I was visiting from New Hampshire and walked in here, I'd say, how come, what's the matter with New Hampshire grant? Why, mm -hmm. why Maine? Is that, is that part of the, so the shtick of the whole thing, that you um, from Maine, or yeah. would it make a big difference if you said we just buy things in New England? It, right. It's interesting. Um, some people will say that the, the image of a food product from Maine com comes with it um, an inherent trust and sense of integrity and hardworking people and a cleanness um, because we have, you know, there's this perception we have clean air, clean environment, you know, healthy forest, water, whatever, right? So there's, there's that, but I'm also watching um, uh, food companies in the, the, who want to scale that are getting advice from venture capitalists right now to drop their locale because if you want to go national, then um, the folks in New York and then later in the Midwest aren't going to care that you're from Maine. They're going to want to just know that it's a good product and it's tasty. And so we've we've seen that just happen to a couple of companies where they've decided to drop the association with Maine um, in the hopes that they're really going to scale. Uh, we're still just focused on being a regional business, and I think that for us, my experience is that um, even in New York City, you've got a lot of people who either vacationed in Maine or they've been to Maine, they have fond memories, and then they see your product or they come to know your product, and they like it because it, it conjures all these fond memories. And, and so I, I think that's helpful. Um, and... And we are, I, I never used to think of Skyrim as a destination tourist spot, <laughs> but there's a ton of visitors that come through the mill, come through the dry goods shop and the cafe that are from other places that adore coming up here. And I almost sold your house for you. Oh, good. good. Uh, with one the other day from Boston who's ready to come join her friend who's living in Cornville. And I showed her the pictures of your house and she yes. said, that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> But, like, you know, I, I feel like I meet that first kind of people all the time. Well, you should look at the book, the, the little <coughs> guest book here at the South Soul Meeting House. People come here from all over the place. Yeah. Montana. And, our, and thank you for hosting some meeting conference guests, but these folks come up for the meeting conference, and Susan Cochran puts them up with um, house hosts throughout the community, and they just rave about these experiences. They rave about how we live and all of our trees. Our, our keynote speaker was from the UK this year, um, Nottingham, and she just could not get enough of how many trees we have, and she just wanted to be outside for as much as she could while she was here, because we don't have these trees where I'm from, and, and we hear this from people driving up from Rhode Island. 
my trip just gets greener and greener as I go up the highway. I love coming up here every summer. Yes? I just want to mention if there's um, anyone that's interested in financing for growing grains or any of the commodities, I work for the Farm Service Agency and we offer open and straight loans. And we also have, um, if anyone is already growing crops, we have a market facilitation program where we pay $15 an acre for um, for anyone that is growing vegetable crops under that program. What's the name of the organization? Yeah, that's great. I'm sorry? What's the name of the organization? Farm Service Agency. We're right located in Skowhegan, right on the East Madison Road. Hmm. And I have information here if anyone's interested. Before I forget, I want to offer you all um, a coupon for $5 off pizza at the Miller's table for coming out tonight. Yes, Cheryl. Just one for Become part of the Main Grain Alliance block project. I would hop on the website, mainbrainalliance.com. There's a newsletter you can join, and you can reach any of these key contacts for the different projects um, uh, that we oversee. So the, re the website is the best resource. Our, I was the first paid part-time executive director of the organization, um, and I passed that on to um, Tristan Noyes, who grew up on a potato farm in Arista County and uh, has been running a lettuce operation with his brother. He lives in South Portland, but he comes up to Skyhegan very frequently for our meetings. And then Richard Roberts, who's in Solon, um, is overseeing this. Very, we, we have intentionally kept that project fairly tightly in Central Maine just because Richard needs to be able to get around with the equipment to these different places. And um, we're, it, we're, it's certainly within our capabilities in Central Maine to grow up to see and then share it with others. Oh, so somebody, so somebody if you have a class, somebody would come around and like, it? Potentially, if it's small enough, it's some, if it's something Richard can do with our small scale equipment, yes. So, what do these farmers do? The people, these farmers that you have in the rustic, whatever the bigger operation, are they investing in big time wheat combines? And, and many of them already had them for harvesting corn past. or. Um, because of the past? What's that? Because they have old equipment from the past. Right? Some of it's old equipment. Some of them were already harvesting corn. Some of them were starting to um, harvest oats um, some years to send up into Canada to the Quaker facilities. Quaker was paying them a dollar a bushel for oats, where now we pay about eight fifty a bushel for oats. And so there were years where it wasn't worth their while to harvest them, and they would just till them under. But some of them have had combines to be able to do that. Um, is that an issue though, having enough equipment in the state? To, it can be, it can be, but the other market that was also already in Arista County is barley. So barley for animals mm -hmm. and Pineland Farms um, and sort of the finishing that they're doing on grain um, for some of their uh, cattle was already part of what was happening in Arista County. Most equipment uh, there's a little bit of everything happening in Maine right now. So just to swing back your business model? Yeah. I'm curious about the shift that you may have made from sort of non-profit conceptualization and grant writing to, to profit-making venture. Can you talk about that transition in your process? There? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I never wrote a grant until I wrote a grant to the Quimby Family Foundation for $40,000 and got it. That was the first grant I ever wrote and received. And um, we put that money towards the very first renovations to the jail building to open up doorways to like allow people to go in safely. <laughs> and, um, uh, and that led me on a path to learning about how to fundraise and um, when was the right time to ask for money. It's when you have money. So when you have a grant in hand, the best time to go find more is while you have that, because then you, you leverage that and you show that somebody cares about your idea enough to give you money, so, so you might be able to support this other part of it that needs money. But I walked into fundraising very blind and naive, which in the end has helped me, because um, I just kept reading these grant applications from the Maine Philanthropy Center, thinking, you know, this is what we're doing. I mean, we're, we're trying to renovate a building, we're, you know, 
that block of Skowhegan had just declared itself a blighted area in order to access federal funds. So we're alleviating slum and blight now, and we're creating jobs, and we're trying to purposefully use the natural resources of the area to create sustainable jobs. I mean, all of that is the language of the grants I was reading, and yet we, we had formed a for-profit business, and, and I was learning that I wasn't allowed to apply for those. And so I went to Somerset Economic Development Corporation, and I said, I need help with this. You know, the, you say that this is your mission. Your mission is to utilize the natural resources of Somerset County to create economic opportunities and jobs in Somerset County. That's what we're doing. So we partnered, and I would write a lot of grants that would go to Somerset Economic Development Corporation to support our early efforts to get renovated and get um, started. And not only my efforts, but we wrote some grants that benefited a lot, a lot of the other scaling that was going on at the farmer's market as well, and on um, individual farms. So the justification being that our work can be a project of the economic development agencies in town to achieve their missions, um, if our missions align. So we, we were very successful grant writing with um, philanthropic organizations, uh, even foundations that care about basic human needs or land conservation or um, you know, any of the causes that aligned with our project. Really later, we found some federal monies, but the, the private foundations were the easier grants to write. And the government grants are, were more difficult to write, so we waited till later on that. Um, I really looked at the grant funding as I justified all my time on the grant funding because I wasn't paying myself for years. So I, I, wasn't, I wasn't paying myself with grant money. I was putting it into infrastructure changes that made things possible and created equity in the business that then could be leveraged more traditionally for, for my own liability so that then I could be liable for. But, but when you go to the banks and they say, well, you bought the building for $65,000, we'll loan you $65,000. You know, or that's the equity in your building, right? then that doesn't work to create, to get a project off the ground like we were trying to do. And I also felt like um, I'll find all the free money I can because this was not just my problem to fix, <laughs> right? Like it's not my fault that uh, we lost grain growing over the last hundred years in Maine and nobody has infrastructure left for this anymore. Why should all of my personal guarantees cover the liability for fixing that problem? Like that's, you know. I don't mind finding other partners to help solve this with me. And so that's how I justified it in the, in the, in the early stages. Um, and those grant funds did build equity in the physical structure and in the assets we now own, which then have let us um, leverage that for either loans that we now are paying back. Um, um, but, the, but we are focused on it being a sustainable business. It has to make enough money to be viable, and, and that's been our real focus for the, for the last seven years since launch. So initially, if I hear you correctly, you, you actually needed to uh, identify yourself as a nonprofit in order to make those initial grants, and only later, uh, as you transform that into a for profit organization, which could leverage those original grants? We, we always identify, when we formed the mill, and again, this is separate from the Needing Conference and the Main Grain Alliance. I've actually never used the Main Grain Alliance as an umbrella for our stuff. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was a little too, could be perceived as incestuous, and I did not want there to be a perceived conflict of interest. So I've never used that nonprofit organization to raise funds. Um, uh, we, I, we formed and identified ourselves as a for-profit mill from the beginning, but we partnered with Somerset Economic Development Corporation, Main Street, um, and others to do that kind of, and KB Cog to do all of that kind of grant writing. Yeah. Uh, I felt to say at the beginning that we do have an end time. Well, there. So we don't want to wear you out, but uh, I think uh, we've come to a point, I'm looking at my watch, where it's probably appropriate to say that this is the end. Great. If you want to hang out and answer a few more questions, uh, that would be great, but if people feel that they have to go, you can go. <laughs> so, Thank you all for having me. This Thank you. Thank you. Very